Welcome back to The Road Forward, a podcast for trucking industry leaders. Brought to you by TruckSpy, the all-in-one fleet management platform built to empower your drivers to be compliant, productive, and safe. My name's Alex, and then this week's episode, Flint Eats a Taco. So. And Matt opens up to us. Uh, I'll be honest, I'm pretty clueless as to how. All right, let's get started. Obviously, last week it was F3, the future of Freight Festival. And by the way, the reason it's called F3 is because they tried to do F1 and then it was in 2020. They tried to do F2 and that was in 2021, didn't work out. And so now they're call, they call it F3. I thought it was F3 maybe because future of Freight Festival, three Fs, but um, whatever. So, but we were invited to like a little bar party or whatever at f3 by truckstop.com and so i'm like hey guys we're sitting here we're having a drink we're just relaxing let's talk about some of the challenges in the industry and kind of what we've seen so far at the show and i think it was a good conversation between flint who is the uh ceo and founder and he was a motor carrier and matt who was our new chief operations officer and he was he joined recently but he did do a little bit of he has a little bit of experience in fedex uh, from from before, and so it was just a good conversation about what we're seeing in the industry. All right, Matt, what was your big learning from the show tonight? Did you learn anything? Well, the the whole thing I was trying to learn today was how these company, how this brokerage thing is happening. Uh, I'll be honest; I'm pretty clueless as to how how a carrier is actually planning loads, picking up freight, picking up jobs, who's interacting with who, um, and how we can help fleets carriers out in the whole process. I, I mean, I think that the process, at least from what I heard today, there seems to be a lot of innovation upstream of the carrier, right? Yeah. Like the carrier is almost like the redheaded stepchild. In this whole, pro- like everybody, all the tech companies here want to talk shippers and you integrate with the brokers and, you know, you need to onboard the carrier for the broker. Like everything was very centered around what the broker needs and very little was about the carrier. <laughs> yeah. Like I think it's one of the biggest problems in the industry, honestly. Well, that's the thing though. Yeah. My whole world has been, how do we pitch carriers? Right. But there's this whole world beyond that. And some of that's represented here. Yeah. And, and that's what... A yeah. big learning experience for me. Yeah, there's a lot of upstream of the carrier. Yeah. I mean, I just remember even from my time being a carrier, which was seven years ago, six years ago. I don't Yeah, six years ago. It sucked. The broker deal sucked to interact with. Like, you had to do it because you need back. But mm-hmm. it just, I mean, it it sucked then. Mm-hmm. Like, you would think with all this innovation, all these tech companies, let's have a conference for the tech companies that are doing stuff in this space. You'd think somebody would have said, hey, let's get rid of that Raycon that we all have to email back and forth and sign yeah. and then I got to call you and negotiate and then oh I come to find out I get there and I need eight foot tarps and only have four foot tarps and you'd think some of that would be solved right in 2022 right 2022 I mean it's not 1980 right oh yeah. it still is though in some regards in oh. some, some of the ways they're doing business well I mean it just goes back to kind of tangent but carriers with so many of them so fractured it's yeah. So well, many carriers. It goes back, yeah, there's yeah. it all comes back to the barrier of entry. There's no yeah. barrier to entry. And therefore, like the biggest guys have already like claimed their piece of the pie, right? Yeah. And they can defend that, that's defensible. But the little guys, like there's there's no way to band together appropriately. To say, look, brokers, like this is how the shit's gonna work. Because at the end of the day, if I say that that's how it's gonna work, well, your little two trucks will keep taking those loads. Exactly. Right? Like there's, there's just no... And since they're cannibalizing each other, right. now there's no margins to make investments right. in their technology. That's why people leave carriers alone because there's yeah. so many of them. They're so They have such little money to work with. Yeah, they don't understand and, their cost. And, yeah, they don't understand the cost. Yeah. And they really are not trying to strategically think. I'm not trying to denigrate everybody, but they're not all thinking strategically long-term because they're, they're just trying to put players out to today. day-to-day. Yeah. But, but that's that's a day in the life, right? I mean, yeah, the, I think the thing is, is once you finally scrimp and save enough to build an actual viable business as a carrier, 
and then you you know you maybe get some stuff that's not brokered or you you know what whatever your path is to getting there and then there's always somebody that's going to start up with their two trucks and all of a sudden compete with you and it's like i can just never fend off right i can never actually build what jb hunt has or what schneider of course those guys have been at it for 100 years right? right now keep in mind this was actually our first time all three of us got to see each other in real life you know we did our podcast a couple weeks ago but this was our first time actually hanging out so it was good and since we're talking about carriers and the struggles carriers are facing and i want to cover in this segment the the headlines i want to cover some of these diesel problems right so freight waves has an article came out friday uh friday october 28 2022 right and it's winter's coming and that could have major impacts on already soaring diesel market so here they explain that because some of these refineries use natural gas and natural gas is going up in price they might actually switch to using diesel instead of natural gas and that in turn will lower the overall diesel market even more so this is a really um it's going to be really interesting to see how winter is going to affect the price of diesel because to my understanding we have a carry on a little bit later on in the show but to my understanding rates are still really 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 cheap so um yeah this is this is a good article worthwhile read um and then actually another article from freight waves is east coast retail diesel prices moving significantly higher than overall u.s hikes okay and basically the subtitle is extremely tight inventories are seen as the driving factor blowing out spreads with benchmark Gulf Coast markets, right? So, and then they have this graph, right? So you got your Houston 470 a gallon, I believe is, what is this? I think this is just um, either price per gallon. I don't think that's at the pump though, because we don't have 470 at the pump right now. We have more than that. So, and then on, but then for the East Coast, it says 602. So it's $2 more expensive from Houston to, to Pennsylvania in pricing. And the main line right here is the right here, the East Coast price blowout has been propelled largely by the tight inventory situation is in what is known as PAD1, okay, P-A-D-D, the number one. The Department of Energy's designation for that region, okay, so they have regions, that Northeast region is called PAD1. Weekly statistical data reported by the EIA this week had pad one inventories of ultra low sulfur diesel at 21.3 million barrels for the week ended October 21st, a more than 7% decline in just one week. But more striking was the fact that those inventories are 56.5% of the five year average for corresponding October weeks, excluding the pandemic influence data from 2020. So that means the Northeast market, pad one market in the Northeast, that includes Pennsylvania, is operating on 56.5% level of inventory, right? So 56% of the fuel you folks are supposed to get in the Northeast. I'm in Texas, but the 56% of, or you're supposed to get 100%. You guys are operating at 56% of the fuel. So no wonder your prices are going up faster than the rest of the country. So this is not good. Definitely a worthwhile read from the freight waves came out Friday, October 28th as well. And, you know, some states have started to try to help out at least some ways, the ways they can. So uh, CDL Life has this article, Iowa issues HOS overweight waiver for fuel haulers amid supply concerns, right? So obviously um, they increased it 10,000 pounds. So if you're a tanker, instead of being your max weight, 80,000 pounds in your combination, you think you can now be 90,000 pounds. So hopefully that does help out a little bit. Um, but I mean, still at the end of the day, man, like this, where we're going is just not good. And to help at least a little bit lighten the mood, you know, I know it can always be, do it can always seem like it's doom and gloom, I should say, but um, a Reddit, tr uh, on the Reddit forward slash truckers page, they, somebody was doing their like, an annual uh, test, like safety test for the winter, right? And so he he said, even though they don't pay me to do the winter safety class, at least they have a good sense of humor. And so right here, the question is, during winter conditions, which of the following are appropriate measures to take? Okay, multiple choice question. They have four options. Turn up the radio and hammer down. Slow down and increase your following distance. Skip your pre-trip inspection because of the cold and take off. D, none of the above. Obviously, the correct answer is skip your pre-trip inspection because it's cold outside. Kidding, kidding, I know. Slow down, increase your falling distance. But it just makes it funny that the other three options are just 
so like they don't make sense. It's ridiculous. So I think they want everybody to get a high score in that test. So uh, a little bit of fun, a little bit of sense of humor uh, in an effort to lighten the mood um, during these headlines and during these just crazy times. Now, a couple of weeks ago, Flint and I wanted to do some content at a truck stop. So we went to the truck stop and I talked about this a little bit before, but what was really funny is like, I was just standing there and, you know, he ended up getting a taco and I was just standing there. I'm like, let me record him just for fun eating a taco. So it was just a funny situation. I didn't eat no lunch. So pretty solid. And then a couple weeks before that, we actually met up to do a install on a bus for a school district. They're testing out our camera systems for, you know, keeping the passengers safe and making sure the drivers aren't doing anything wrong on the road. And once we were done with that install, I showed him some funny memes. Okay. <laughs> some memes that I thought hilar were hilarious. So I'll put them on the screen so you can see it, but here's uh, his reaction to some of those. <laughs> Will Smith then got fat driving the truck, didn't he? <laughs> right we well, see it's like when you get your cdl you yeah. know you put on some weight right okay yeah. next yeah. one <laughs> and then the damn handle will break off on you is the right deal. <laughs> yeah 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 i yeah uh, when i watch these people parallel park right uh, so now we live like in the mid cities here in dfw and you i see soccer moms try to parallel park their little SUVs or like yeah. boat ramps too. You yeah, could use boat the boat ramps, ramps like yeah. watching somebody yeah. go down the boat ramp. It's yeah. like goodness gracious. Just jack but you know now the little F one fifty, the cute little F one fifty has the little knob in it, right? Right. <laughs> and you could relate that one because you're you were a hazmat carrier, right? No, we no. weren't no. hazmat, but we did oversize. Okay. Like the you know the hard heavy stuff. Right. Um, but yeah, become a hazardous become a hazardous material how's that saying go a laugh a day keeps the doctor away <laughs> so but let's try to regroup and refocus our you know the point of this episode which is you know there's a lot of struggles being a carrier it's really difficult whether it's competition or whether it's you know not enough technology and or maybe like that we're going to discuss in this interview uh it is clinton he is uh the owner of boss hog logistics he's a dispatch service and a motor carrier and he he does really really good work and so we discuss some of the uh some additional challenges that truckers face so let's just get into that interview so in my opinion this is the problem with trucking right and why the i think some of the turnover is really high that right you uh, by the way, we're, we're taking a look at FreightWaves published an article about U.S. Express, and there's a picture. They kind of broke down some of the revenue that each truck makes. And so one of the uh, issues is that trucking, um, um, it's good because you can, you know, essentially have no experience, get into it and, and get a job that's pretty stable, pretty consistent. But it's bad because the moment you become an owner operator or you go get your own authority, you can you can start grossing five, six thousand a week right? That's like pretty consistent. You can do five, 6,000 a week on a semi, especially. And the reason why the turnover is high is, or, or why owner operators want to hang it up after a few years, maybe in my opinion, is that that is both that, that becomes your ceiling indefinitely. The reason I say it becomes your ceiling indefinitely is because like you gross five or six and unless the market does something insane, that's all you can gross. It's not like somehow you with a single truck operation, right? With like, think about the regular Joe Blow. I bought a pick, I bought a semi. I'm on the road. Like, he can't, st there's nothing he can do to gross 10,000. There's nothing he can do to gross 12,000 with that same one truck operation. There's nothing he can do to gross 15, right? There's no way to grow your business. So you come in there, you want, you, you have a floor. Let's say you want to, your floor is about 4,000, but you have a ceiling, six or 7,000. That's it. There's absolutely nothing a individual owner operator can do in the industry to increase his revenue. That's it. He's stuck. And this is why a lot of good people quit from the industry. Yeah. And, you know, they just, the turnover is so high. Like, what do you think? I don't, I don't know, man. I mean, a, a one man single operation. Yeah. You're always, you know, you're going to have that, that pinnacle, that high, you know, that, that ultimate, that $10,000 week, you know, you did it, you, you did a great job, you know, and, and then that's it. There, there's never, ever going to be any growth. Hell, I feel like, I feel like that's that right now. I've only got a five truck operation, you know, all non CDLs. And, and, you know, yeah, you know, last week I had a truck mm -hmm. do 13, eight. This is his first week out. I told him, I was like, 
It's never going to happen again. Like you just achieved greatness. I don't know how we did it, but we went, you know, I rolled the dice and took him out, out into the mountain West and he did great. And he's like, let's do it again next week. I'm like, that will never happen again. So even, even just as a small operation, not even just a one man band, it's, you're, you're absolutely right. There is no, once you hit that peak, it is what it is. There's no more, right. you know, you can't make more money with one truck and trailer. Um, you just, that's it. You're stuck. And so, um, and that's, that's good if you're new. Cause then you like, you can count on that. Hey, I got 5,000 coming in every week if I'm working, but it's also sucks because there's no reason for people to stay in it any longer than they absolutely have to. I think a good majority of them is also, they just don't know their cost. And, you know, and that's one of the reasons why, you know, it's so rough and why it is so cutthroat on the load boards, you know, because you get these new guys that fresh out, you know, with a new authority went and, you know, spent 70, 80, hundred thousand dollars on a, on a, on a whole rig. And, and they're just hungry to get out there and they take, you know, they don't know that, you know, a dollar 30 is, is right. terrible, you know, for, for right. a truckload. And now those brokers, you know, Brokers got it one time, so now they expect, you know, hey, I can right. do that every they, time they, now. Uh, right. And brokers, to my understanding, is they save your company like lane rate. And so then if you try to go back and say, hey, I need two bucks, not a dollar thirty or dollar fifty, they'll say, Hey, well, what do you mean? You last week you hauled the exact same load for that same rate. Why all of a sudden? And so um by taking cheap cheaper freight initially, it actually makes it more difficult for you to get out of that rut of cheap freight. Um, but you you're like out of all the people that I talk to, you have also one of the, like, you're also the most aggressive at like getting direct customers, right? It's like you, that is like sales is your skill set, I would say. And so it's like, you do really good in that. Like, what do you, what do you, like, what, what advice can you give to carriers that are getting out there trying to get sales and trying to get direct, direct freight? And I, I just, you know, first I'm starting in my, in my local area. If I've get an opportunity mm-hmm. to break away and just go drop business cards, I'm absolutely doing it. You know, I'm, I'm trying to get out from behind the screen and, uh, and get out there and, and really pound the ground with it because, you know, for myself, you know, I take the DAT, the DAT has the lane rate and I, and I use this even off the load boards. Uh, you know, you know, when, when a broker posts it as a full truckload and they want expedited, dedicated service, well, and then you give them what the lane rate is because, you know, we have that power. We pay for the upper uh, tier subscription. So you get that lane rate as you click on that load and you're like, well, you know, I'd like to be at that, you know, 278 a mile. That's what the lane rate. And they go, oh, that's what we pay semis. Well, listen, man, we, we have the same cost. We, we pay we pay for the same amount for fuel. We, you know, our insurance is roughly relatively close. Uh, but also you're getting the benefit because we're expedited. We're going to get there way quicker than a semi. You know, I've got a buddy that, you know, out of, out of Houston that uh, he's in a 48 flat and he says all the time, he's like, man, I roll in, I'm waiting hours on in. I see hot shots roll in, they're out, in and out and I'm waiting. And then on top of it, you know, semi is a little slower. So they're five, six, maybe six fifty a day. So whereas, you know, on a straight transit day for my drivers, we're rolling 750 miles all day. So how are we penalized for that? So anyways, circling back, I use that lane rate for my directs and I shoot them a train and I'm, I'm transparent with them. You know, part of my spiel is, Hey, uh, you know, we, we're totally transparent. Uh, every invoice I send to you, I take a little snippet of that lane rate was, which is the, the 15 day average for that particular lane. Just so you know, you're getting what you're paying for. There's no over, uh, you know, we're not charging ungodly rates and, and, you know, Sometimes, you know, it, it's good, you know, I mean, it's, it's way better, obviously moving with direct clients and getting to see, you know, getting that lane rate price of 240, you know, there's been some times where it's like, oh, it's only 220 for that lane. Well, that's okay. But I'm building that relationship and they're calling me more in it. And that's how it is right now. Uh, here in Arkansas, I've got a couple of directs. They call me all the time. We're moving, moving their product two, three times a week. We've now worked out a deal where, uh, you know, I kind of, you know, one of the lane rates was like 390 and I was like, you know what? I tell you what, if you just pay my miles from where I'm at in Arkansas to where you're at, to where you need it to go, and then back to my house at 250 all miles, and uh, we'll just do that every time. And that was a huge selling point for them. And now every time, you know, like I said, they're, they're calling and texting all the time. So uh, you got to get off the load boards, man. But I would say for new carriers, pay for mm-hmm. that upper tier subscription to, get to on, on that to get that lane rate and start 
quoting those brokers at that lane rate. You are not any less than, than a 48 flat. If they are posting it for a truckload and in that comment, they say exclusive or dedicated. Well, to me, that's what it should pay. Right. Yeah. How can you say, hey, this is dedicated and you can't put anything else on your trailer, but we're going to pay 20, 30, 40 percent less than the lane rate data when you're taking up my full truck. It's like that doesn't make any sense. So, right. Uh, um, yeah. Go ahead. Today, I called on a load out of Philadelphia going down to North Carolina. It was seven foot, eight thousand pounds. Well, we're in the non-CDL game. So we're typically ninety five hundred pounds or less. Um, I call them up. It was Landstar, which, you know, I was surprised because most of my Landstar loads are good. I mean, they pay really, they at least they pay me really good. And anyways, I called this guy and he's like, it's got to pick up between nine and 10. It's a partial, by the way. It's got to pick up between nine and 10 on Thursday. It needs to deliver Friday morning in Monroeville, North Carolina, 560 miles away. Okay. And, but this is a partial now, eight foot, 8,000 mm-hmm. pounds and uh, paying 560 miles, paying 600 bucks. And it was air ride. Which my guy has air ride on his non CDL unit, but it's like, okay. how insulting can you guys get, man? Right, right. It, yeah, it's it's frustrating. Now, what about like you know? I was talking to a different uh, carrier before, and he was he had like one of the worst situations of double brokering from Landstar. So it's like, how has your experience about double brokering been? I hear it's on the uptick like crazy. It is, and I, I actually witnessed it today. I got to drive around Seattle. We saw a post for 2100 bucks going back to like Minneapolis and uh, you know, it's like 1700 miles paying like a dollar 15 ish, you know, and it was, it was a decent partial. It was 20 foot, 3000 pounds. You know, it's something you could put together. And uh, I wasn't interested in it because of the weather right now in Montana. Just, you know, I'm not going to put my drivers through stuff like that for a dollar 15, you know, uh, yeah. but literally 20 minutes later, a, a red eye uh, broker pops up. Same thing, same everything. And now for it went from 2100 with the original. Now they're posting it for 1400 bucks. Uh, I've been guilt. I, I, I've been, I've been caught up. I've, I've had double brokered loads and uh, you know, that's where you just got to open that line of communication with your drivers and be like, Hey, you get that BOL and it's got a different carrier broker on there. You let me know as soon as possible. And, uh, and we did one out in Pennsylvania. It was picking up for a uh, Landstar. And it wound up, we got the paperwork and it wound up saying Echo Global on there. And it just so happened to be a broker I know really well. So I called him up and he's like, he asked me what I, what I got for it, which I didn't think it was bad. It was like, you know, 235 out of Pennsylvania going back West. That's, that's decent money for a non-CDL. And uh, he's like, well, well, we'll nix him. And he sent me the Raycon Direct. And he's like, well, I actually paid like, I don't know, it was like 2,800 for it. So it was actually almost like 280 a mile. Um, wow. So, but yeah, you just got to pay attention to those to those BOLs, and when you see something like that, you know, uh, I've also Which, caught it, and and they didn't give it. You know, I called that broker. I went through the channels and found out who it was, and called them and let them know that this load's been double brokered. They didn't. The care. original broker didn't care. Didn't care. And so that's that's why this is an interesting industry because, like, not only are the people spending you know hundreds of thousands of dollars on trucks and trailers and setups. But then it's like a minefield out there. Not only do you have to worry about your, you know, your own carriers, like other truckers undercutting you, then you also have to watch out for the minefield of double brokering, right? Then you're losing money on not getting the right rate. And so it's like, there's, it's almost like there's no winning in trucking. And I'm curious how technology will solve this because I mean, there's a lot of startups and whatnot there. They're all trying to solve this. Um, But you, but you wholeheartedly recommend obviously using technology like um, the DAT rate view, right? Like that's a, that's a good piece of tech that you could recommend. Um, any other, any other technology that you're using that you like really benefits you as a carrier? You know, I mean, there's, there's subscription apps that we use, you know, for communication, you know, that you introduced me to, you know, years ago when I started dispatching for you, it was like, you introduced me to Slack and I I was like, Oh my God, I hate this. And then two weeks in, it was like, Oh, this is the greatest thing ever invented, you know, because as a dispatcher, you know, we're working from the computer, you're out in the field driving, and this is all in one integration to where you can get it in your, on your phone in your hand, and then it allows me to keep my eyes on the load boards because now I'm just copying and pasting. I'm hot keying, you know, Control C, Control V, and I never got to look away. So that's been, yeah. you know, that's been one of the best things on the dispatch side that I highly recommend uh, is that Slack integration if you have multiple, um, 
multiple drivers, you know, if you're a one man band only booking one guy, well then a simple text isn't, you know, it's not crazy, but when you're booking, you know, five, seven, you know, eight drivers, well, every, every second counts, you know, so, um, you know, it's just streamlining operations. You know, we, we all have iPads with Apple pens and when they come in, we all fill everything out electronic. You know, my first year was always printing out paperwork, hand jamming it, scanning it back. I, I, I look back and I'm like, Oh my gosh, why, why would you ever do that? You know? Uh, because now, you know, you can just fill it out super quick and it saves <laughs> automatically into your OneDrive or your iCloud, however you've got it set up. And, uh, but, uh, you know, I mean, on, on the dispatch, that's really, you know, tech wise, you know, it's nothing crazy, but definitely streamlines operations and makes you way as the dispatcher behind the computer, way more efficient. And, uh, when it's, when it's about being the quickest and the fastest making that right. phone call, you know, small things like that add up, you know, uh, right. You know, I remember from an old sales thing, little hinges swing big doors and it's like, yeah, that yeah. makes sense. The, 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 the 15, 20 seconds that you, you know, save not having to wait for a printer. Like that's a big difference because that's, that's an eyeball that you just removed from the load board that you now might've missed the load that just popped up and is now gone. Yeah. Right. Um, so, wow. Um, well, dude, the podcast is called the road forward, uh, Clint, what do you think? Where, where is the, what is the road forward for, for trucking? What is the road forward for your company? Um, you know, share, what do you think the future holds? I know, I don't know, man. I, I think there's always going to be a need for expedited hotshot freight. Um, you know, mm -hmm. I think it's just finding the right, the right people, you know, Huge thanks to Clint for coming on the podcast and discussing some of the challenges that, that carriers are facing and giving some advice on, on how, you know, in general carriers could do better. But I want to hear from you guys, like what challenges are you currently facing? And that'll do it for this week's show. Let us know in the comments down below what you think, and we'll see you next week. Bye.